emerging from my hideous cocoon. Cracking, scarily, from my glistening chrysalis, it is I. It is he, horrible him, Stephen's avatar, of which many legends are told. All right, everybody, what's up? How you doing? Um, I'm still alive. That's true. I'm alive. I am existent. I am exent. Check, check. check some stuff here. Um, how's everybody doing? I had to pop in early. I could not let the timer go um, for the whole thing. Um, apologies for any setup weirdness today. You know, I moved. This is my first time streaming in the move. And uh, you, get, you guys know how computers are, where it's like they claim like, oh, yeah, it's all numbers. Everything's going to be the same. You move, you change positions, you go to another room, anything, any little change, everything resets. Everything needs to be recalibrated, settings redone completely. So apologies if things are um, a little uh, shaky for a while while I get used to the new situation. I have noise suppression on right now. Maybe I'll just leave that off for now because it's very pretty quiet right now. Um, hello, everybody. Hello, Rappy, Albie, JG, Patrick, Phil Worth, Saman, Storm Rated, everybody. Hello. Um, you know what? I can't. Right off at the beginning here, I've got to just share the important info. So excuse me if I can't say greetings to everybody, but I just do want to. All right, this is what I want people to know about very quickly. So there is a link for this in the description of the video. I wanna be very clear, everybody. Um, this tool is not available yet. You can't get it. The download button on this page does not work. <laughs> it's not out yet, um, but it is coming. If you want to read more info about it, the New York Times today, posted a article um, written by Kashmir Hill. Uh, she talks with uh, Carla Ortiz, of course, the wonderful Carla, who is doing so much for all of us. Um, and also with uh, Greg Rakowski, I believe she interviewed Greg Rakowski for this one, but also the team, you see them there? Wow, glorious team, powerful team, true power in this team, real power in this team. Um, she speaks with them about the tool that they've been making uh, glaze is what they're calling it. This tool will help protect your artwork from being used by AI. Um, I want to put it out there. I've heard touch and go things about um, other kinds of tools that don't try to do this exact thing, but you know, there's attribution tools that are bubbling up. There's um, tools that add category watermarks and things like that. Um, I, we're in sort of a wild west period here where people are gonna have to sort of poke around and see what they wanna use, what they don't wanna use. Um, this is the tool that I know the most about. I have heard uh, a lot about it behind the scenes, you know? Um, I've, it, maybe some of you have, done the surveys that this group put out there for artists to take. You know, maybe someone that you know shared it around and you did one of the surveys. Um, we're we're gonna have to wait to see what happens once it's out in the wild, right? Once people are actually using it. I have not used it, right? Um, uh, I do not have special access to it or anything like that. But I did want to start putting it out there, letting it percolate out there for people who don't know, who haven't caught wind of it. Um, I know a lot of you probably have because I'm, I'm not the first person talking about this news, but this tool is coming out. Glaze is coming out. That's what this one is called. It's from the University of Chicago, um, made by a very kind team that are amazing for putting their, uh, their time and effort into this, but you can see their names there. Carla has been working with them as well. Amazing. Professor Ben Zhao did a great thing for us. 
Um, and they have a, a PDF white paper out that explains um, how they do it. I can't read that stuff. I don't understand that stuff. And you can find more info about it on this site. Again, please, the button does not work. You cannot download it. I can go to download. It does nothing. Um, I just want people to start bookmarking it. And they say right here, we plan to release Mac and Windows versions. Also note, it is free, right? They're going to make it free. It's research coming out of a university, the University of Chicago. They're going to make it available for everybody. So uh, just keep your eye on this. I've got the page bookmarked. Um, I don't know exactly when they plan on releasing it, but um, I think that anybody who has been following the AI stuff and has been looking for what they can do, some sort of direct action they can take, some way that they can protect themselves. Like I said, it's not like there isn't other stuff out there, but this is the tool that I know the most about. Um, and uh, it's the one that I feel best about. How does it work though? Well, I can't tell you how it works, right? Because uh, it really, it's black magic. Let me tell you, um, Ben Zhao, I I'm sorry that I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name, but the faculty lead on this, um, you should look him up. He's a little legendary, you know, he's in deep, you know, he he's very in deep. He, uh, he uh, developed techniques to do cloaking like this for facial recognition. That was uh, some of the stuff that made him um, famous within machine learning. Um, so it, there, anything a person like that comes up with is not something that someone like me can explain on a technical level. But what you're go how you're going to experience it is this. You will, it'll be an app. It'll be an app that sits on your computer. You will upload your picture. You will put your picture into the app, right? You will pick a different effect for your work to be confused as. So you will give it your new painting and you will just tell the app, make AIs misinterpret this piece as abstract art or something along those lines. It will do subtle changes to the pixel values in the image. It, you can see examples uh, if you pursue some of the, um, well, if any of you have done the survey, then you've seen actual examples of how it changes the images. It is remarkable how little it changes your art, um, but then still totally confuses the AIs on the other side and makes them regurgitate things that don't look like your work. It's, I'm amazed. I mean, I, when I first heard what they were trying to do with it, um, I didn't believe it. I mean, I, I thought, I was like, there's no way that could actually be possible. There's no way they could actually do that. But um, then I saw the results and uh, yeah, again, black magic. I mean, the, the people who actually understand how, um, how the tech works there, um, you know, they can just, they can see what we can't and they, they found a way to make it work. It's pretty incredible. And um, it's just very exciting. It's very, very exciting. So please, um, I just wanted to put this out there right up front um, before I got into more chatting or drawing or anything like that. Um, just go to this website. I have a link in the description if you're interested in this stuff. Bookmark it. Again, it does not work right now. You cannot download it. It's not ready. I just wanted to share the info and the website. Again, you can click that download button all you want. It does not work. It's not supposed to work. If you read the text under the download button, it says we will release it soon. So just bookmark it, get ready. Um, and I'm sure that once it's actually, once it's out so that you can get the app, you're gonna, you know, it'll sort of, you'll hear about it real quick. How many goats do you need to sacrifice to make it work? It costs zero goats. It costs zero goats. You don't even need to make proper hecatombs to the worthy gods. You just get it for free. The power of university research and benevolent people who want to help people protect their data. It's a beautiful thing. Mwah. Zero goats. No goats. What accent is that? If I'm going to do an accent that's going to get me canceled or make somebody angry at me, I, have to, I should at least know who I'm offending. No goats. Zero goats to make the tool work. Does everybody feel like they get it? Again, I don't get the tech. There is a white paper out. You can actually go look into the tech if you want to know more. Let me, uh, so if we go to the New York Times article here where they talk about, if anyone's interested in learning more, this New York Times article came out today, 
this morning. I'd go give it a read. It is called, uh, This Tool Could Protect Artists from AI-Generated Art That Steals Their Style. Very direct. And if we go to the links within this, we're going to find it here in a second. Yeah, this mentions that it's similar to tools used to protect photos from facial recognition systems. Sorry, I lost the link. Let me find it. All right, so if you, this link that's just glaze can see, boom, for those of you who are into tech stuff and things like that, this is the Arxiv archive for it. So you can go find the PDF on there. And then if this is, a, if this is what the kind of stuff you get up to, if this is the kind of stuff you get up to, you can go in here and you can read the team's actual explanation of how they did it, how they made the tool work. So for anyone who actually wants to know how it works and you know can, can handle some, some good academic knowledge, oh boy, there it is. That hurts to see. That hurts to see. The old enemy, math. You've come into the wrong domain, math. Oh wait, uh, what? You want to? You want to help? Well, that's a that's a surprise. Yeah, so I, I, come on in. Yeah, I I, I have tea, decaffeinated tea. I'm trying to to I'm trying to take in less caffeine these days. Yes, come, 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 have a sit. I feel like we haven't had a chat in so long. So if you can handle stuff like that, if you can handle the math um, for everybody who wants to know how does it work, how does it work, you can read it all here. They have explained how it works. Uh, I cannot read the math, um, so they, uh, there, there's a gap there for me. But please go check it out if you can handle the technicals. And again, if you want the layman's explanation, it will be an app that you up, it will be an app that you have on your computer. You put your image in it, you choose an obfuscation style, right? So let's say you draw realistic fantasy art. You tell the app, I actually want AIs to interpret this image as abstract or Jackson Pollock or something like that. Um, and it will do subtle changes to your image on the pixel level. Here we're at the technical gap. I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand how that's possible. I, I've been, I've been exporting JPEGs my whole life and I would have thought that couldn't work, but the people who actually know how computers work, they knew it could work and they made it work. So you change it and there's a sliding scale. So it can do, um, it can, it can make the process a little bit more obvious on your picture. It can make it less obvious on your picture. Um, it kind of looks like a, a noise filter, the edited version of your image. Um, and yes, they are thinking through defenses for up resing, down resing, blurring, sharpening. Um, this is a very serious team. So yeah, they're, they're already thinking ahead to ways that you could sort of work around this. Well, you know. Uh, who knows if there really is a way to stave off something like an AI and data poisoning arms race, but um, they're taking it very seriously. Uh, they're clearly incredibly smart and incredibly skilled. Um, and yeah, so you will pick sort of the degree of protection. Um, it makes these subtle changes to your images. And then if it gets scraped into an AI and is associated with your name and such, if someone says, you know, give me work in the style of, Steven Zapata, if it has the critical mass of the cloaked images, it will unfortunately, instead of looking like my work, it'll look like uh, whatever I picked, abstract or whatever. Um, and the interesting thing about this tool is that the effects are very strong. The effects are very powerful. And um, it's not even that everybody needs to use it. The interesting thing about technology like this is that if, if there's just a critical mass of people using it, it can throw the systems enough, or it could potentially throw the systems enough that the AI companies will just be forced to be more serious and careful 
um, about how they acquire their data and sort of come meet us at the table and um, only take stuff that people consent to. Because, yeah, if uh, again, it doesn't need to be everybody. If there's just a critical mass of people using it, it will they'll basically be sitting out there like a, like landmines on the internet. And if they're just going to scrape indiscriminately, it's going to be a problem. So I just wanted to put that out there. I was actually, um, I was going to stream today anyway. And then, you know, perfectly just a couple hours ago, I saw that this had been posted about. Um, so I was like, yeah, God, this makes perfect sense to talk about this today. So here we are. Mm -mm 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 -mm. That's the good stuff, friend. That is the good stuff. Again, for anybody who's just joining, the link to that tool is in the description. It's the first link in the description. Again, it is not ready. The site is up, the site that I have up there, you can go there, I'd advise you to bookmark it, um, but it is not ready to download yet. They do not have it available, but they're gonna put it out very soon. So just go to that site, bookmark it. You'll hear when it comes out. All right, glazed people, take all my money. I'm in. That's the beautiful thing. University research and read on the site. It's free. They're going to put it out there for free. We will not commercialize our protection tool in any way. It will be available to use for free upon release. It is solely for research purposes with the goal of protecting artists. Damn, son. <laughs> I mean, damn, damn. Did the AI kidnap you? Where have you been? Man, things have been crazy. Things have been crazy. Um, things have been absolutely nuts since January. Um, <laughs> but here I am, you know, now I'm back. Well, you know, I, I, will, I will be back. I'm here, I'm back right now. Um, and I'm very excited to be streaming again. Um, I, I, am, I am going on vacation tomorrow. I am starting vacation, just a week. I'm gonna go see my family. I haven't seen them in a long time. Uh, but then I'm back, and I'm back to streaming. The Terrorizing Local Baristas Fund, $5 from Estras Munoz. Thank you so much, Estras Munoz. I really appreciate it. I really, really appreciate it. I mean, not a, you probably don't even understand how much I appreciate it. But trust me, Estras, trust me. I appreciate it. I'm appreciating it with my whole body right now. Tibia, fibula, Baximus maximus, gluteus medeus, gastrointestinal tract, sigmoid colon. Appreciating it with all of it. I'm gonna have to find my new local baristas to terrorize though, because I moved, so. You moved? Yes, I did move. Yes, I did move. It's true. Um, what was up? Uh, I moved, that made January, the beginning of January extremely hectic, and then the day that I moved into my new apartment, um, I was asked to give a TED Talk at UC Berkeley on very, very short notice. So that became the focus of the second half of January. Um, M moving and the TED talk linking back to back had the result of making me get a month behind on work, basically, uh, specifically on feedback for the course. I had a huge backlog build up. Thank you for everybody who was patient through that time. So once I got back from Berkeley after giving the TED talk, uh, which was around the beginning of February, um, I've spent the past two weeks doing nothing but getting caught up on feedback. And yesterday, baby, got caught up. Got caught up yesterday, baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You said it was impossible. You said it couldn't be done. You said it couldn't be done. But guess what? <laughs> guess what? Guess who got caught up? It was your boy. It was your boy, Steven. All the way down, responded. Responded. Responded to every assignment. Responded to every assignment. Just so you know what that means, when I got back from Berkeley, I think I had I think I had over 60 assignments sitting on the docket. It's a lot, but I got caught up. There was a, I hit that moment yesterday where I submitted 
uh, that last piece of feedback and I reload and I'm like, oh my God, I did them all. I did them all. Yeah. <laughs> so yesterday, yesterday I finally got caught up. It was a lot. It was a lot. So that's what I've been doing for the past couple of weeks. And here I am. As soon as I was caught up, here I am, baby. Um, I, I wish it had been faster so it wasn't like, oh, now I'm ready and uh, now I'm going to go on vacation. But um, I was hoping to avoid it, but I am going to work on vacation because uh, I don't want to get behind again. I'm too happy now that I'm caught up and, you know, got my, got my responsibilities within my hands. So I don't want to go right back into being a week behind. So um, I'm going to work on vacation. I'm going to do feedback on vacation uh light you know it's it's my family time you know they, they don't live around me anymore so i really got to prioritize it but um i'm gonna do a bit of work light working so that i don't get just a full week behind i'll still get a little bit behind since i'm not going to be working full time but i'll do a little bit so it's not as much and then as long as i can do that when i get back then we're just doing the splits baby back to streaming and stuff like that um for anybody who is just coming in uh, the main thing that I want to get out there on this stream is that the Glaze Artist Protection Tool, uh, it's going to be released very soon. I can't say quite when, you know, because I, I don't know. I don't know when, but um, the site is up. Uh, the New York Times has an article discussing it today. The release is imminent. So I really want people to uh, just, there's a link to this in the description. If you're worried about AI scraping up your work, um, using it, to train models on you and things like that. Um, please keep an eye on this tool, Glaze, which is being put out by the University of Chicago. Um, go to the website, it's in the description, bookmark it, and once it is available, um, I'm sure that uh, you'll hear about it and you'll be able to go grab it. But I just want to put it out there, give it a little signal boost, let it uh, start percolating out there. Uh, this is one of the, I, I've been so, I was, I was so, so happy about this tool. You know, I've, I've known it was being developed for a while, for a while, you know, in my head, I'm like, oh, it's such a while. It's like <laughs> all this AI stuff is like happening in a really compressed time space. Um, a while is probably a couple months now or something like that. Probably, yeah, probably less. So, um, it, uh. It's just, um, it, it, it's had me so excited, you know, it's knowing about it has given me a lot of just hope, you know, and it's, uh, the good thing about it is, you know, I feel good about a lot of the stuff that we're doing, you know, sort of getting together, you know, look, looking at producing systemic change, litigation, legislation, you know, getting the word out there with TED Talks and stuff like that. Um, all that stuff's good, but this is different. This is direct action. This is the first thing that is like, there's, it's actually a concrete thing that you, an individual in your home, you can do to your images that will hopefully protect you and, um, and help you oh, take a breath and just get back to happily making your artwork uh, with less worry, you know? Um, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future, you know? I mean, could kick off an AI arms race. But uh, if it does, for all the computer and computer software engineers out there, I think there's a future in data poisoning. If these tools are going to come for every sector, I think that every sector is going to need some sort of power to the people data poisoning technique. Uh, where can I watch the TED Talk? I want to see your TED Talk. Um, let me put a link. I had started and then I got distracted. No, not Photoshop. All right, I'm going to update the description at the bottom of the links section. My TED Talk will be there. And I'll put it in the chat right now. So they're still editing it into a clip. You know, it'll be its own clip uh, released on the TEDx website. But um, you can still see it on the archive of the live stream, but the live stream is the whole event, so it's like eight hours long. So there's the link. I did that with the timestamp, so if it works, it should start right at my talk. But if it doesn't, go to, I'll give you the timestamp, two hours, 47 minutes, and 30 seconds. And that is where my talk 
begins. That is where my talk begins. Friends, fellow artists, lend me your ears. Now begins my great talk where I yap, yap, yap and complain about AI. How did I become this? How did I become this? What is Glaze? Can anybody tell me? Um, Glaze is the tool, being a tool being developed by the University of Chicago that will help artists protect their work from AI. It is not currently available. What I have up is a link to the website. The download button does not work yet. I just want to be very clear because I know people are going to start clicking on it and being like, hey, I think it's busted. It's like, no, it's not out yet. The, just the website's up and I want to put it out there, bookmark it. I have it bookmarked and I'm sure we'll all hear once it's actually available and you can download it. Um, but I want people to know about it early so that they can start spreading the word and things like that. So yeah, Glaze is a tool that is, a, is an app that will allow you to do a technique called cloaking that will allow you to run a process on your artwork that will make AI confuse it for a different kind of artwork. And that will hopefully begin a long series of direct action artist protections. About the TED Talk, how did the audience react to your talk? From the screen, it looked very positive, but maybe you had perceived it differently. I mean, it. I, I just want to say, the team that put this together did amazingly. They knew that in Berkeley, I mean, pff, San Francisco, right? I mean, they knew I was going to be public enemy number one with this TED Talk. So they they didn't even play around. They put up a really nice wraparound bulletproof plastic screen in front of the whole stage when I was performing. And that allowed me to just focus on giving the talk even though the audience was hurling tomatoes, potatoes, zucchini squashes, navel oranges, delicata squash, every kind of vegetable and fruit. Um, they did amazing. And, and the speed with which they put up and brought down the protective screen, um, I, I asked them, I was like, do, did you guys work for Gallagher or something? You know, like I, I didn't think anybody could do that so fast and so efficiently. Like, do you guys have experience with this? Um, but no, they were just amazing. I mean, they were students at, at the school and they just, they had their heads on right. They knew what they were doing. Um, yeah. <laughs> Steve's on TED, interesting, yeah, there, it's a, no, no joke for real though. Um, the team that put the, the TEDx talk on at UC Berkeley was fantastic. Uh, all student run team, student organizers over at UC Berkeley, um, they did a great job. I mean, they ran an excellent show. Um, I've been involved with a lot of stuff that was ostensibly more professional and way fancier and the shows just fell apart and these these students just did a remarkable job. I mean, it was on time. They were super kind, clear communication. Um, it was just really, really nice. They did a great job. Um, and, and yeah, the audience was great. The audience was great. Uh, the people were very engaged. I had a lot of interesting conversations afterwards. All sorts of people, artists, uh, software people, coding people, uh, software engineers, a lot of them students at UC Berkeley. Um, Lots of people talked with me afterwards. They found me immediately afterwards. They found me at the wine mixer and stuff like that. And I had a lot of really, really interesting conversations. They made me feel quite optimistic, actually. Quite optimistic. It was great. It was really, really great. I'm glad that, I'm glad that uh, the audience reaction came through on the live because uh, the, the live is just my microphone feed. So I, I take it you probably couldn't hear the audience for real, you know, because it's, it's just a tight uh, lav mic there. Um, when they release it as a clip, I believe they mix in, you know, it's not just my, my microphone audio, but it's also the ambient audio of the audience. So I think you'll be able to get the audience reaction pretty directly on the edited clip, but I don't know when they put that out. 
I think that um, that comes out probably in a couple weeks or something like that. Was it for students or open to the public? It was open to the public. It was real open. You had to get tickets. You have to get tickets to any TED event, but it was open to the public. Basic syphilis, hey, great to see you, Steve. Great to see you too, basic syphilis. Keep, keep, keep it basic. Keep it basic. That video needs to get more attention. It's a little buried. Eh, I mean, you know, no one, I, I'm just putting it out there, you know, the timestamp on the live stream archive because, you know, my audience wants to see it. You know, they're, they're hungry. They're chomping at the bit for more quality Zapata content. And I am to deliver. I will deliver. So I give it to them. But um, you don't, no one's going to watch that. No one's going to watch a timestamp within an eight hour live stream. Um, but Ted takes it and they edit it into just the talk into its own clip. And they put it up on the TEDx website. And then, you know, depending on their, they have a long review process. And then maybe it goes up on main TED. But um, uh, that clip, Hopefully that won't get buried. Hopefully that will give it a second life and it'll go off because it's more condensed and concentrated and laser focused. It's just, it takes time because they, they send it off to the editor. Uh, might be soon though. Cause I think when, when we were done, they told me it usually takes two to three weeks. So maybe it'll be another week, something like that. Drive by commenter with 10 beautiful dollars. Delicious. Cyber Gems channel had an interesting Metal Gear parody about AI and deep fake oversaturation. It suggested AI as being a catalyst for state, man state mandated de anonymity of the internet. <sighs> that'd be some wild knock on effects, huh? God, that'd be crazy. What are we living through? What are we living through? How's this setup, by the way? Uh, I tinkered with it a bit before I stream today, but um, I'm in a new place, new environment. Um, my studio right now, I have a, I have a, I have a separate studio room, uh, thank goodness, um, but uh, it, there's not a lot in it. It's all bare walls, so it's probably very echoey, so I apologize for that. Um, I will fix that soon, hopefully. Once I get more stuff in here, I, gotta, I, gotta, I wanna get a drafting table, I gotta get a few more cabinets, um, I'm gonna get some foam to stick up on the walls. I think that should help with the echo, but apologies if for now it's a bit echoey. Just, uh, I don't have that much stuff, you know? Live pretty frugal. Real Spartan lifestyle for Steven Zapata. Stream is surprisingly clean in quality and audio is crispy as butter. That's good to hear. It's only going to get better. And for everybody who's, who's been around, you know, my old streams at my old place, just, let's just take a second to listen. What do you hear? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You don't hear shit right now. It's quiet. It's not perfectly quiet. I mean, it's New York City. There's still noise. I actually don't live far from the airport. But, um, you know, on a clear day, the planes are a little quieter. I mean, this is pretty good. I mean, this is so much better than the stuff I used to have. And uh, it, it's, it's, lo it's low enough when any noise comes in that even when I, I can run, now I can run noise suppression on my live stream audio feed and it sounds fine. The noise at my old place was so bad that I couldn't even put noise suppression on it because the OBS noise suppression, which doesn't let you tinker with it, it, it had to get so aggressive to edit out the background noise that it would cut out most of the words that I would say. So now it's low enough that even when there is some noise, I can use noise suppression and it's just not a big deal. So huzzah, hooray, <laughs> hooray. I hear my guilty consciousness, <laughs> says Nick. Yeah, that's pretty good. So again, for anybody who is just joining, um, I just wanted to get the word out there about the, the upcoming Glaze AI protection tool. That's what you see over here on the screen. It is a tool being released by the University of Chicago or a team at the University of Chicago. It is being released for free for people to use. 
Um, the link to that site is in the description. It's the first link in the description. It, um, it is not yet available. You, it has a download button. The download button doesn't work. You see if I click it, it just takes you down here and it says, we plan to release Mac and Windows applications in the coming weeks. So I just want to put it out there. I hope you all will bookmark it and that you will, when you, when you hear that it's out, give it a whirl. The team is very receptive. So um, they've already put out two big surveys where they got all sorts of feedback for, from people and you know, showed them varying levels of protection. Um, so once it's out there in the world, I expect they will continue to be uh, very responsive to feedback. So, um, uh, and please not just like, oh, it's not working or it's having a weird thing like this, like give them positive feedback too. If you try the tool and, it, and you like it and it works, or you just wanna tell them, thank God, thank you so much for caring at all. Um, I hope that everybody will send positive feedback to the team and let them know that uh, they're on the right track and that they're doing a great thing and that people appreciate it. Um, it's just, uh, it's a wonderful thing. So um, do keep your eyes on it and, uh, and, and, and try it out once it comes out. I wonder if it works. From what I have seen, it works. It does work. It's, uh, I can't, how does it work, says Kessa? I wish I could tell you, but you don't need to take it from me because they will tell you how it works. You can, um, they have put out, so this is their white paper on it. This is an academic paper. So if you really want to know how it works, you are free to take in all of this incredible info from them. And if you can read God's hidden language of mathematics, then uh, I'm sure that you will get more out of this than the people who cannot, like myself. So go check that out if you really want the, ooh, look at all those citations, holy crap. Um, if you really want to know how it works, um, go check it out and then uh, maybe you can explain it to the rest of us. But um, the technique itself is called cloaking and the idea is that you run it through this process to make your artwork be interpreted by an AI system as a different kind of artwork, which is a pretty, pretty cool way to get some protection. Pretty cool way to get some protection. Do you know if it will be accessible on iPad? I don't have a desktop or laptop. I'm not sure. Um, plan to release Mac and Windows applications. I guess it depends what kind of laptop. If you have a Windows laptop, you could probably use it, but Mac, Mac desktop OS and uh, the tablet, the iOS, um, those are different. So that wouldn't have crossover. But if you have a Windows laptop, should be able to use the Windows version of the app, no problem. Mathematics is like cocaine to me, says Great White Sufi. Well, you're gonna have fun with that. I'm sure you're already having fun with uh, all the math that gets hurled around in the AI discussions. Tried to read that, but my eyes burned instantly. Easy, easy. You gotta protect your eyes. You need to make art. Oh, you said, do you know if it will be accessible on iPad? I'm not sure, but they are putting it out there. Um, I don't know if they're going to open source their code. Yeah, I was trying to skim there, but I don't know if they're going to open source their code, um, even if they don't. I think that people will see the utility in tools like this very quickly, and there's gonna be varieties floating around. Um, I'm sure someone will make an iOS version, but um, until then, you, if you can get a, if you can sort of collect the pieces that you do, um, sort of store them up for a little bit, and then get access to a desktop, use the app uh, to sort of batch process them, and then upload them, upload the edited versions after you batch process them, That'd be the way to go for now, but I'm sure someone will make it. What's popping, dude? Nothing much. It's been a crazy time. It's been a crazy time. I moved. I'm in a new place. Gave a TED Talk. Been doing a lot of course feedback. It's been a crazy time. It's been a crazy time. I'm eager to get back to, uh, you know, I've, 
it's interesting, you know, I feel like my focus lately, and I'm not sure, I didn't really choose it. It just sort of felt important. Um, my focus lately has sort of been on the AI stuff, having discussions about it, um, a lot of behind the scenes stuff as well, you know, talking with people, helping with things. Um, things like the TED Talk are, are a heavy lift, you know, it, takes, it, it was a lot of work to write, to rehearse, get it approved, things like that. Um, I, I feel like that's been my focus lately and that happened naturally because I think it's very important and it's clearly pe people need it. You know, I've been getting a lot of communicados from people where they're like, oh God, I feel like you're the only person talking about it. It's just like, clearly it's helping some people. Um, but I didn't necessarily choose that by choice. You know, it all started with that YouTube video and um, I actually was not expecting that to sort of go off when I made it. Um, but um, yeah, I've been riding that a little bit, just sort of staying with that energy. But I look forward to having the space again to prioritize my creativity and just uh, getting back to my stuff. You know, I've been drawing a bit, you know, I've, this is, you know, you know, in that crazy time, I have been drawing a bit, you know, I've been drawing a little bit, a little bit of drawing. You know, these are morning coffees, you know, I do them in my sacred ritual time in the mornings. My neighbor is cutting wood. It was quiet for a while, but check this out. Now I can do this. I can just put on my noise suppression. It's actually workable. A little bit of drawing. I'd like to do a, I'd like to put out a sketchbook for this year. It would probably be, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to print it until the end of the year, maybe next year. But um, I have been wanting to make another actual physical little book. So these are, might all be the beginnings of that. I don't think of any of these as done, you know. I want to go back into all of them and work them up a little bit more. But just initial ideas. So I've been very busy, you know, I've been a little bit out of contact with you all I know. You know, I just haven't had a lot of time to stream and post and stuff like that. But don't you worry, still been drawing. Always drawing. Been drawing through all this craziness. I didn't draw when I had to write the TED Talk. That those those like 11 days, there was no drawing there. That was that was emergency status. <laughs> that was working as fast as possible. That was working as fast as possible. I got some other things hiding around here somewhere, but I don't remember where the pads are. Do you have a book right now? Yeah, I have an one. I have an old little zine like sketchbook that I put out that was the first thing I made like that. Um, Actually, let me go get one of those. I'll be right back.
I always mean to show these on stream, to show this on stream, but I, I can never find the, I always forget where I have the book, but I found them again while I was moving, of course, because you have to take a quick inventory of your whole damn life when you're moving. But I had this one from a couple of years ago. Not a couple, a few years ago. I forget now, maybe 2018 or something like that. So I'd like to make another one like this. It's just a little collection of images. You guys will have seen most of these. It's a little dark, my image. Give me a second. That looks like it. I forget how to work my camera. It's been too long. That's all right. Has some detail shots. I forgot about that one. That little Gates of Hell sketch. I gotta take that all the way. I, this was like my first study drawing for it. And then I redid the design a lot, but then I never made a final. I wanna do that one big though. We'll be doing some big drawings too. Now that I have more room, we'll be doing some big drawings. Offending hand. This drawing means a lot to me. It probably doesn't look like much. You know, it isn't much, but this one's a big one for me personally, subjectively. That drawing means a lot to me. That drawing freaks me the fuck out. I printed these before uh, an in-person event that I did with Modern Day James and Anthony Jones in New York City a few years ago. And, uh, you know, I had this at the event and, uh, you know, people could buy them. And afterwards, we all got drunk at a bar and uh, I was signing them super rapidly. And I would flip to this page with the World Tree because it has the most blank room and I would do little sketches in there. And they got sloppy. They got sloppy. They were some sloppy sketches. Lots of love, Steve. So yeah, I'd like to do another sketchbook like this. I've been getting the hankering to have a physical one again. I probably do, I'd like to do it bigger. You know, this was my first test with like, what is it? What's the workflow like to put the book together and find a printer and stuff like that. Um, I probably wouldn't be able to use the same printer if I go bigger. But maybe, I don't know, I didn't really look too much into their options really, but um, I'd probably go bigger, make it um, maybe eight by 10 and do a, do a perfect bind, you know, so it has a nice square spine. But yeah, sketches like these that I've been doing in the mornings are probably the beginnings of something like that, stuff that I'll put into the sketchbook for 2023. How expensive is it to commission a printed book like that? This was the run of this, cause you have to get like a hundred minimum. Um, and most places have higher minimums than that. But the run of this, I don't remember. I got a hundred of them and it was a few hundred dollars to print it. It's a little hard to remember now. Um, I still have a bunch of them. Where can I get this book? If you ever meet me in person, you can get it. Cause uh, they're, 
I, I don't ship them. You know, if, if I had to ship them, I'd have to charge way more than, a, you know, this little zine printing job is worth. So I don't sell them right now. Um, but if you ever cross paths with me um, in person, you can get it from me in person. That's the only time I've ever made that they were ever available was um, when, uh, when I did that event, when I did that live event in New York City and uh, I had them there. And then, you know, when I've crossed paths with people, I give them to them for free. For anybody who's just joining and who is worried about the AI stuff, keep your eyes on the University of Chicago's Glaze project. It is not available yet, but you will find the link to this website in the description of this video. It is a tool that will uh, help you protect your work against AI. Um, it does seem robust. It is a genuine uh, new, well, you know, not entirely new, but it's a new application of a technology that's been around cloaking. Um, it's novel as far as I know, um, it should be out soon and it'll be free. How fun is that? You always have them on you. I'm wearing eight of them right now. You don't understand. I mean, I wish I could show you, but I'd get banned from YouTube. I have eight of those books strapped to my body right now, strapped to my body with heavy duty military straps. Heavy duty military straps. <laughs> Damn it, Stephen, I was in New York. I know, it was a bad time. I was in the middle of all that moving. I'm sorry, Mel. Don't worry, the, the, but that book, you know, don't worry about that little sketchbook. Once the new sketchbook comes out, that's gonna be the one you want. I don't know. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta look into it. You know, it'd be nice to make a little, a little book, a little booklet. I'd also like to do it, man, it'd be nice to do it all crazy. You know, I'd like to hook up with like, yeah, someone who like does books like these and make it really nice and stuff like that. Just takes a lot of planning. Takes a lot of planning. Where do you exist? I exist in a lot of places. I mean, you know, I'm a complex, multi-dimensional entity, you know, and you're interacting with a 2D extrapolation of a 3D extrapolation of a 4D extrapolation of a fifth dimensional being, you know? And uh, even in this highly handicapped state, my power and charisma obviously come through. So, can you imagine if you were to gaze upon my real form? Psst. Let's keep it like this. Let's keep it to this kind of a relationship. Let's keep it to me being an inch and a half tall on your monitor in the little corner of this video. Let's keep it like this. I think that's what you can handle. This is good. This is good. I'm stuck drawing skulls. Any idea how to get out of that? Psh, dude, why leave? Why get out of happy skull territory? Your life will kick you out of happy skull territory at some point, but for now, just happily draw your skulls. Just draw your skulls. Also, for anybody who wants to know more, there's also this New York Times article. Um, how many of these can I give? Only 10. Um, if you have a New York Times subscription, or uh, I actually don't know if this one, I don't know how much of this is paywalled, this particular article, but if you wanna learn more about the tool and some of the work that Carla's been doing um, with the team back there, I would recommend this article. Good little download on the tool and a good little download on what is up with the current state of the EA. The EA. I miss your funky playlists. Those funky playlists were to cover the unbelievably oppressive background noise at my old place. Now, 
We draw in silence. Now we draw in silence. The funky playlist will be back, don't worry. I, um, I don't want to... I don't want to do music right now because when I stream with music, I like to just play it over my speakers because I don't like having headphones in. And there's nothing in my studio. There's not enough stuff in my studio right now and it's all bare walls. So it's very echoey in here. So I don't want to blast music and then just create this reverberating echo chamber that's going to get very, it's going to reduce the quality, the clarity of my speech and everything like that. So, but it'll be back. I'm sure we'll do plenty of streams with the funky playlist again. How is Fanny? She's good. I'm going on vacation tomorrow. Tomorrow evening, I'm taking off to see my family. So Fanny is with my in-laws while I am gone seeing my family. How do I dig myself out of creative bankruptcy? You got to figure out how you got yourself into that hole in the first place and reverse the process. You back right out. Beep, beep like a truck, baby. You back right out of that hole. Just look at everything that you did. Look at all the bad calls that you made. You're like, oh, did I? Did I... Oh, wait a second. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did I listen to what my dad thought about art? Did I let what my dad thought about art subconsciously influence what I make and why I make it? But, but he doesn't know fucking anything about art. He hates art. Why did I do that? Oh no. Oh no. And it's the same problem for everybody. I mean specifically that one. It's just dad stuff. Just have a conversation with your dad. I don't know, you might have, is he dead? You might have to pray to him, I don't know. Just have a conversation with your dad where you kind of work out all the art stuff. My dad's dead, so I'm not making fun of your dead dad. My dad's dead too. You might have to have a conversation with your pop pop that's like that, and then you'll be fine. Then you'll never worry about that stuff again. You'll be A-OK, -okay, baby. Do you have survivor's guilt for being one of the few artists who might benefit from the AI apocalypse? <laughs> no, no. I'm especially well-equipped to survive this. And I'm also especially well-equipped to take the spirit of art into the stars and into humanity's long future. I'll let nothing hold me back. I will make sure that drawing continues at any cost. No, I don't have survivor's guilt. I have survivor's pride. And if I'm the only one left out there, well, damn it. It would be an honor to carry that torch. No guilt here. I'll draw a little bit, because why not? I claim this is an art stream, right? I should draw sometime. Monsieur Steven, don't forget my super chat. Sorry I missed it, let's see what you said. Ooh, it better be good. God, it better be good. You better not have said something boring while you gave me money. Nope, why'd I, sorry. I inserted an ad, that was my bad. I did not mean to do that, that was an accidental click. I forgot where the super chat button is. It's been too long since I've done this. Where's the... I did not mean to do that. I'm 
Why is my viewer activity dead? I'm sorry if everybody's stuck watching ads. I'm just gonna go to studio. Okay, I got it. I got it. Let's see. All right. Gabli Inks. Oh, wait, I can pull this one over. I can use you guys. Can't see that. Gabli Inks with the 25 PLN. I'm, I, don't know, I don't know what that currency is, unfortunately. So I'm just going to assume it's 800,000 US dollars. Thank you so much, Gabli Inks for the 800,000 US dollars. I, I, I can't, I really can't begin to express uh, how much that means to me and my family. I mean, that's, that's the beginnings of generational wealth right there. Um, I'm humbled, truly. So I'm, you know, probably immediately after this stream, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna put most of that in some sort of a, an ETF index fund, you know, something that tracks the S&P 500. Um, but I'll break it up, you know, I'll be you know, careful about it, you know, I'll, I'll put parts of it in, uh, in bonds, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll check the yield on the 10 year T note, you know, I'm gonna be very responsible about it. Maybe I'll get a financial advisor, you know, but it's all, it's all made possible because of you. So this is, I don't wanna put too fine a point on this, but this is clearly a big deal, clearly a big deal. All right, so Gab Links, who is now my uh, sole uh, patron and source of income says, hello, Stephen, hello, everyone. What are your thoughts about constructing the drawing as you go? I think it helps to exceed the limits of imagination. Um, I think it's great. I, I feel like recently in my life, I, I've started doing more, um, more winging it optically with less construction going on. But um, I spent a long time constructing drawings uh, in all sorts of ways. You know, I used to build them out with like boxes and cylinders on the page. I did Riley method. So that's like doing constructions that are really obsessed with like rhythms as well. Um, there's all sorts of ways to construct, you know, and a lot of like proportional canons and things like that. And I tried them all, you know, and, and I had some sordid love affairs with several of them. Um, these days I, I've kind of, I'm, that's all still influencing the way that I draw, but I kind of just go point to point now, which is a pretty typical arc for a lot of people. Um, but yes, in general, I think construction is great. And you probably, you probably can't get good solidity point to point. That is to say, just like visually assessing like this line to this line without sort of drawing through and things like that. Um, you probably can't get a lot of solidity with point-to-point -point unless you've sort of keyed in pretty deeply, uh, have a lot of familiarity with construction in the background. Um, for most people, there's always going to be the freaks out there who, who really don't need it at all. But I think for most people, that's going to be the case. Is this like A4 paper? This, this one is actually, is it A4? This is pretty small. Uh, I always forget what A4 is. I only know in inches. This is probably eight by 10 in inches. Is that, eight? Is that A4? I, I'm sorry that I don't know the UK ones. Not the UK ones, the uh, metric paper. Are the, are the A measurements metrics? I actually don't know. Am I stupid or smart? What am I? Whoops, did not mean to do that. But while we're here, might as well check my focus. Sure, why not? Been a while since I've used my camera. I'm hitting all the wrong buttons. I'm hitting all the wrong buttons. And that's why she don't, no, 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 no. She don't like me anymore. Because I'm hitting all the wrong buttons. I don't know where it is. I got gross, sorry, that's my bad. It's just, you sing and you say stupid shit. It happens. All right. A4 is a high school notebook page. High school, age school, baby. Ba da ba da ba da ba ba da ba da ba da. 
No, I've already got a bunch in here. Let me use a darker, darker pencil, a darker pencil. And I don't have one of these pencil cases. I gotta get one. pencil drawer is upside down like all the pencils that I don't use are at the top because I when I moved I just poured it um, I just poured it into a bag and then I just poured it back into my shelves How's the new apartment? It's good. It's good. I'm happy. I'm also glad to just be done moving. Holy crap. Moving is so much. <laughs> it is so much. Um, we have a lot of work to do though, because uh, it's, it's mostly empty right now. You know, I used to, I was in a much smaller place, my last place. So um, once we unloaded like all of our furniture, all of our stuff, um, we kind of looked around like, damn, we can't fill this place. We don't have, <laughs> we don't have anything. Um, and then usually you would start the, the shopping spree once you move in and realize that, but um, both myself and my wife immediately got hit right when we moved in. She got hit with a crazy work deadline for the project that she's on. And then, and I got asked to give a TED talk. So right away, we just got completely inundated with work. So uh, we still haven't really filled the place. There's a lot of work left to be done. A lot of shopping to do. And I'm not good at shopping. Don't like shopping. A lot of shopping to do. Gotta buy um, a lot of shelves. Maybe some credenzas. Steven, how often do you work with graphite powder? Would you recommend it? I have never been able to make it work for me. It's too messy for me. It gets everywhere. I don't like it. I use, um, I use pan pastels every now and then, which are like graphite powder, but a little different. Um, they're powdered pastel, powdered black pastel. They play decently with graphite. I've used them a few times. I haven't been using, um, I haven't been using them lately. I use them on uh, really big drawings. But they're messy too. They're just slightly less messy than graphite powder for me. When I use them, I try to put them down early in the process uh, and expect that I'm going to go over Everywhere where I put it down, I expect that the result will be unsatisfactory. And I'm just using it as a base to speed up putting in flat values or base value tones. And, um, and I know I'm gonna need to go in and correct it by hand. How do you get such dark darks with graphite, Stephen? All right. Here's the thing, here's the unexpected answer to this that a lot of people need to hear. 
you have to press hard. Now, so V77 said build up, and yes, building up does help, but you can never, with a soft touch, build up, even if you lay graphite down for hours in one little spot, you can never, with a soft touch, build up to the dark that you can get by pressing hard on the paper. And people are scared of pressing hard with graphite. You know, they're precious with their drawing, they're worried they're gonna etch the paper. First off, use super high quality paper, right? I don't draw on crap ever. When I'm doodling, when I'm sketching, my morning coffee, the stuff that I'm gonna throw away, I doodle and I scribble on the best paper I have. I scribble in expensive moleskin sketchbook sketchbooks. I draw, I do my morning coffee on Strathmore 400 bristle paper smooth. I don't draw on crap. Um, and the reason for that is because if something goes right, I just wanna be able to finish it right there. I wanna know that I don't need to transfer it, I don't need to redo it somewhere. If I want, I can take any sketch that went very well all the way whenever I want. So draw on really, really good paper that will not get etched and that will stand up to abuse on really good paper like this stuff. Even if I go black, 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 if I sit there with a kneaded eraser and rub, 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 I can't get it back to perfect white, but I could get it back to like a 10 or 20% gray. And that's good enough. You can't do that on sketch paper. You do those things, you click your head into it, you press hard on the paper. Here's the problem. If you, are, if you never get used to pressing hard with the graphite, you are gating off the whole top 30% of the possible value range that you can do from all of your drawings. And then that's why most people get silvery, washed out gray pencil drawings. Um, you've gotta be really familiar, like I'll do it here. Like you need to be really familiar with the black that you get when you do this. Look at that. Go until you're gonna break the tip. You need to be really familiar with the black that you get when you do that. Stuff should be flying all over the place when you do it. You gotta know what that feels like. Now you don't do huge areas like that, but when you've got like a sphere or something and you need to do that ambient occlusion right under there, in the place where you know that's the darkest part of the drawing, you've just gotta be comfortable. Boom, that's where that shit goes, baby. That's right where that goes, baby. I can be confident that that's where that goes. And then that is what all the landscape painters are talking about when they say the dark accent. If you feel comfortable, you know, you know that's gonna be the blackest black that you can make. Don't lie to yourself, you know that's it. So just put it down. And now when you do the rest of the sphere, you know, all right, well, it's not gonna get that dark, but I can go all the way down there so I can make the core shadow way up here, something like that. And it's like, oh, well, how dark is the background? Is the background that dark? Oh yeah, well, if it's that dark and that's the nature of the ambient light, then the core shadow can go even darker, baby. And then you start making relativistic decisions about your value range. And then you don't need a value scale and you don't need to use the Munsell color system. And you don't need to be having all of these goddamn grayscale bars hanging out all over your desk and you can just draw intuitively instead of bullshitting yourself your whole life. We have fun, right? We have a good time. Thanks for the question. I gotta sharpen my pencil now after that. Also, you get the course. Okay. No problem. Same when you use the stump too, you gotta be comfortable pressing hard with the stump. If you like to use the stump. I use the stump all the time. I press pretty hard when I use the stump. Not all the time, but I'm saying, like I just explained, I'm comfortable pressing very hard with the stump and I'm conscious if I'm sort of being very gentle with it when I don't need to be.
Do you recommend using plastic paper to prevent smudging or that's for baby noobs? I just use regular paper. I just keep a folded up piece of paper like this under my hand. Steven, your course has given me so much confidence in chasing my own images. Thank you. It's all form, baby. Hell yeah, Mel. Hell yeah. I love to hear it. Or use charcoal. Never. Charcoal's great. It's just not for me. I've gone back to it many times and I just... Too powdery, too dark. For the kind of work that I like to do, I love the um, I love the bite of graphite. You know, I love how it resists. Hey Stephen, do you have any experience in sculpting? My clay arrives in the mail in a few hours. And I'm excited to start learning how to sculpt. Oh, I, I've sculpted a bit, but I am bad at it. I just tried to sculpt. A couple days ago, I was sitting, I grabbed some clay and tried to sculpt something on my desk. And uh, yeah, I very quickly was like, ah, oh, right, that's why I draw. Gotcha, cool. I love, I love sculpture though. I, I, I've been on and off with sculpting all my career just because um, there's always this feeling that I have that I'm like, I should... There's gotta be a way into it for me, you know? Like, it's all form, baby, you know? Like, I, I know I can transfer this stuff. It's just, I don't know. I'm so addicted to the directness of um, of drawing. Now, I know that's a funny thing to say because you have to craft an illusion when you draw and you don't have to craft an illusion when you're modeling with clay, but it's like, when I know what I want, I have enough facility with drawing now that I, I know how to draw it, you know? and, and I don't, it's like I could just make that view so quick when drawing and then when I'm sculpting, it's like I'm, I'm often thinking about a particular view and it's like I have to make the whole damn thing to get that view and then it's just like, you know, it starts to feel like a lot of replicated work, but I don't know. Then, then on any given day, I won't feel that way and I'm like, damn, I really need to get, I really need to get into sculpting. Vasat, Vasast says, hello, Steven Zapatar, did you miss me? It's a trick question. Any museums in New York would be great to visit. Go to the, um, if you like, I mean, it depends what kind of art you like. If you like the classical stuff, obviously the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and you'd probably also wanna go see the Frick collection. Uh, the Frick was closed for a long time because of, um, of COVID, but I think it reopened. You should be able to go see it now. Sorry, someone's calling me, pestering me. Let me just make sure. That is indeed junk. Yep. Steven, I need to know your top five movies and a movie I've never heard about. Um, I don't know, I, I'm not big on the lists, you know? I, I can just think of, I think of it more as like, here's five movies that pop to the top of my mind right now and that I think are really good. Um, Parasite. It's always just stuff I've seen recently. That's always what these wind up being. Uh, I liked Triangle of Sadness. Um, I think that's what it was called. Uh, that's a recent one, that's from last year. Um, the Witch is one of my favorite movies of all time.
Um, the Witch, Parasite, Triangle of Sadness. Triangle of Sadness mostly just because it's recent and interesting. Um, the Prestige by Christopher Nolan has always been a favorite. I've watched that movie so many times, you have no idea. <laughs> it was um, back in high school, because it came out a long time ago. Um, I got the DVD of it. I saw it in theaters and I really loved it, so I bought the DVD. And um, it was one of my favorite things to just play in the background over and over again while I drew. So I've, I, you know, not watching it, watching it, but just like ambiently playing in the background, like right next to me while I work. Uh, the Prestige, I've probably listened to no lie, hundreds of times. Truly hundreds of times. How do you film overhead shots of your art? I have something called a glide gear. Actually, I think my, my gear, I might have taken it out when I needed a bunch of room for AI links. Let me check. Yeah, my gear is not there anymore. But... Um... I have something called a glide gear. It's just a, an overhead rig that people use for like unboxing videos and stuff like that. You can also make your own pretty easily if you're so inclined with um, like some photographer's tripods and uh, some C clamps and just put like a steel bar between them. And if you know how to like drill or clamp a, um, a quick release plate to attach your camera to. You can make your own pretty quick. If you're handy. I'm not handy, so. Cyan Knight says, I'm halfway through my three month life drawing course. So far my construction, gesture, and cross contours are fantastic. But I'm lacking in my rendering, any advice? I hate to say it, but you get the course. You get the course. No, just kidding. Um, I mean, I'm not kidding. You do get the course. But um, to answer in a way that's not a shameless self-plug, um, you know, rendering is, people have different theories about rendering and things like that. For me, rendering is form, right? So if, if your rendering is off, my, what I usually assume a student is doing wrong is that they don't have a clear enough mental, um, I almost said image, right? But I don't mean like a hallucination you're staring at. I'm, this is not, this is orthogonal to aphantasia and discussions like that. You don't have a, a vivid enough mental conception of how you think the thing you're drawing sits in space. And I know that that sounds reductive, but if you understand the principles of light, so that is to say um, why photons interact with form the way they do, the difference between diffuse reflection and specular reflection, the reason that photons on a curving form don't produce a linear fall off in values, but instead produce a uh, increasing, um, is it geometric or exponential, fall off in values. If you understand just those base principles, right, those aside, the only other thing that could be wrong is that, like I said, you are not grasping what the hell the shape of your object is in your head, right? And again, that does not require because I can hallucinate an apple right now if I want to, but uh, the, the hallucination has as much of a problem as this drawing on the paper does, right? Because when I'm seeing it in my mental second monitor, it's just another 2D goddamn image. Even if I start, you know, pretending I'm rotating it in my head, um, I'm still only seeing flashes of 2D, right? So it's not about that. You're not trying to trace something out of your brain. It's that when I look at what I'm drawing, I say like, oh yeah, I know this is all kind of generally, this whole back area is one flat value plane. This is facing more downwards, but also more towards us, the viewer. This part of the peck faces up, this faces out, this faces down, this is gonna push back out and up. Damn it, I put an arrow on my real drawing there. Like, y you need that sort of 
that clear, like anywhere where you would put your finger on the drawing, you would know what damn direction is this pointing in. You know, you need that understanding. And if you really have a grip on that, if you also then have a, a honestly a vague conception of where the light source is, you can guess it. You can guess it pretty well. You can guess it pretty well. There's no lurking magic down there. And, and we also don't want to get obsessed with the idea of getting the correct answer. You don't need the correct answer, right? You, we've all seen plenty of correct 3D models that look boring as hell. You don't need the correct answer. You need a cool answer. So there's a lot of wiggle room there, right? Um, yeah, those are my basic thoughts on why, usually why most people's rendering suffers. What advice do you have for people with aphantasia, which I suffer from? It's the inability to have mental visuals when you try to imagine it. Don't worry about it. I, re I really mean it. Um, you, don't, you don't need it. You don't, it's not, it's, it's not an impediment to making art. I know very few artists who, I know very few artists who can vividly imagine things in their head who ever do it. You don't need to do it. I don't do it. I can, if I close my eyes, you know, I don't see anything projected into the black void of my head, but b behind my eyes, but in my mental second monitor, this phantom realm, I can conjure anything that I want and I, it can look like a movie real, you know, I can rotate things in 3D. I can, you know, put textures and lighting and all that. I can imagine stuff like that. I, I, my brain has that visual has that visual inclination. And often when I think, like when I'm distracted and daydreaming and stuff like that, I'm thinking visually, I'm like playing movies in my head, but I literally never do it when I'm working. I never do it. I'm only ever looking at what's on the paper. I'm just reacting to what the drawing is. And I can't trace those images anyway. Like what, what good are they to me really, you know? I don't think it matters. I personally really don't think it matters. I never, while I'm working, do I sit there and be like, ah, oh, this part's confusing. Let me go to my mind palace and imagine this part and start rotating it. And that's just like a weird, I don't know what, like, it's, it's unfalsifiable, you know? Like whatever you're, you would be doing in that space, like I, I, it's, it's not like my brain is, you know, if, if I imagine this guy and I start lighting him, you know, and I'm rotating the light around him, are those right? Are those shapes correct? How the hell would I know? I don't know. My brain could be making every kind of mistake. It doesn't matter, you know? You know, Stephen, that's something well worth repeating because a lot of artists suffer with the hands don't do what the brain sees thing. Yeah, I, I don't think they're supposed to. I think that, that the idea that you would sort of trace stuff out of your head is sort of a, a bad mimetic thing that goes around in art circles or from people who haven't drawn for a long time. Nobody does that. Nobody. I really don't think so. I, I don't... I also don't understand what the... Um, you could maybe trick yourself into thinking you're doing that, but what would the, what, what even would the mechanical process of doing that be? Like, would you be like trying to shoot laser beams out of your head? Like your, like your eyes are a photo projector and then you're like kind of tracing what's there. It's like, what, what, what would that actually look like to trace the images in your mind? Nobody's doing that. You, you need to, you need to fix the stuff that's on the paper. If aphantasia's impact was real, then I think every artist without it should theoretically be really good early on when no one is. Yeah, indeed.
Nick says, here we have a saying that goes, appetite comes while eating. And I think ideas too come while you draw, not before you put the pencil down, which is why it's more important to just draw. I agree. you just kind of, you know, get to work, magical things tend to happen. What are you, what are you going to have a solo? When are you going to have a solo show, dude? Isn't, isn't this a solo show? But who's here? You scared me. Was there someone behind me? Isn't this a solo show? I'm always solo here. I don't have any friends. I'm always solo. I'm always alone. <laughs> this is my solo show, man. Oh, you mean like a solo fine art show, like at a gallery or something like that? I don't know, I don't really, um, I don't dabble in the fine art stuff, really. I just draw. All right, Epfi Dude says, hard disagree. Learning to visualize and project images onto the paper has been the number one thing to improve my art and my art journey. And just drawing has been the most toxic mindset for me. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I don't, I don't wanna discredit what any individual does, but I do wanna point out that like, Art is like completely structureless. So I'm not surprised that there'd be someone who like th that, exactly what I said, like doesn't work. Uh, of course that's their practice because it's like the practice can be anything, right? But it's like that works for you and that's good and that's worth everything, right? But I mean, I it's just not a solid or robust thing. There's so many artists who don't visualize. There's so many artists who don't project images. There's so many artists who just react to what's on the paper. Um, and there's so many artists who apparently have full aphantasia and they're still incredible artists, right? There's, there's plenty of artists who claim to have complete and total aphantasia and they make incredible work. So, I mean, you, you've got the particular configuration of temperament and requirements. And, and part of that is going to be you have the particular, you've had the particular experience of experiencing just drawing as toxic enough to motivate you to not just draw, but to try to have as much intentionality as possible behind what you do. But I think it's hard to separate out how much of it is the benefits of intentionality and how much of it is the benefits of, you know, projecting images onto the paper. And again, for you, like I totally agree. If you tell me, yes, it's all, for me, it's all about projecting the images onto the paper. It's like, I believe you, I absolutely believe you. I'm just saying that I've met a lot of artists and talked with a lot of them and you're like, you're the one, you know? <laughs> There's no, I, I, I don't know many other people who do that. I know people who have played with it. I mean, I've played with it, right? Like, I remember there was a period in my early 20s, because it was when I was working, I went a period where I was doing this experiment where every day I'd come home after work um, and I would do a sketch, I'd do a painting, and I would stare at the canvas and plan the painting for as long as I planned on doing the painting. 
my 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 wife thought I was nuts or just silly. Um, so uh, I, I was doing an art job, so I wasn't trying to work for that long because I was already burned out by the time I got home. But if I knew I was going to do a half hour sketch um, or an hour sketch, I would put on a timer. And I would literally, like a psychotic, stare at the PSD or at the canvas or at the paper, and I would plan the image for that whole time, for a half hour. I wouldn't draw. So I did it for a half hour, an hour, whatever else. I don't think I ever did it longer than an hour. And then I would try to attack the painting afterwards with that zeal and with that gusto of, of having like... I planned out what the image looks like, every corner of the picture, every inch of it, visualizing it as vividly as I could. I also visualized the process. I visualized laying the strokes, which would come before, which would come after, what would overlap what, what would cut into what to make the process as expeditious as possible. And it was an interesting experiment. And I, again, I have strong powers of visualization. It did nothing for me. None of those pictures came out good. <laughs> I did a bunch of them. I did a lot of them. It's like the variety of practices that can exist is vast, vast. Ayub says, hello, Stephen. What would be your advice for people who are starting to feel like their obsession with art is starting to kill their social relationships and intelligence? Get married. I'm only half kidding. I mean, that, that helped me a lot. Uh, you, sometimes we need help. You know, you can't, you can't put everything on you all the time. All right. Um, before I had that, I experienced that and um i went through a period where it was before this movie came out but if you've ever um have you ever heard of the movie yes man with jim carrey i think it's jim carrey uh, where he just says yes to everything as a social experiment i had arrived at that i had arrived at that on my own as a need of mine on my own before that movie came out um so i, I went through a period where I, just, I said yes to absolutely everything just anything anyone brought up shit I really didn't want to do. I was like, I'll be there. You know, a, a real rough tone of just as soon as stuff that normally I would have inched away from, I just went, mm-hmm, yep. Going, yep, yes, yes, I will see you there. Just send me the info. I promise you I will be there. And I said yes to everything. Um, it doesn't clam up your schedule that much actually because uh, like in my experience after I did that, um, about half of stuff gets canceled. About half of stuff doesn't wind up going through. So you only wind up doing about half of the things that sort of come your way. Um, but you might need to do something like that, you know, if, you're, if you don't have like a relationship thing going on. But, um, you know, just being as realistic as possible, um, you can't put everything on, on you. Or, or if you can get help, get help, you know? Uh, Stay close to your friends who drag you out and who make you go to things, you know? If you find yourself in a relationship with someone who sort of has the opposite social tendencies as you, cleave to them, you know, and trust them. Let them drag you out. Let them make you go places. Let them make you go to parties and have people over and, you know, you know you'll sit there hating it while it's on the calendar. And then once you're there, you'll be like, yeah, this ain't so bad.
Is this a redraw? No. I drew this a while ago. I'm just continuing on it. It's not a redraw. It's from my pile of morning sketches. I have a question. How does an artist get freedom while working in a harsh market like concept art? I want to make the art I want, but the daily job as a co concept artist sucks my energy. It's not easy, man. I mean, it's not easy. Uh... <sighs> if you're doing jobs, right? There's almost no way around it. I mean, you're going to have to do stuff that you don't want to do. You know, you're, you're providing a service. You're providing a service for money. Um, and I'm just trying to think of how to, how I can carefully word this so it doesn't sound too discouraging. Um, There's so many ways to think about it. So the energy sucking is one of the main problems because it puts you in like a downward spiral. You know, you get that oppressed feeling like nothing can go right. Like there's nothing you can do. Step one is to break out of any pattern that may be there. Um, and I, this is hard for artists because we often refuse to break out of patterns because we're artists and we love patterns. But um, you know, take a week off, um, disappear, you know, just do something to break the pattern. Um, I've heard certain substances can help with pattern breaking and making gaps in our repetitive ratiocination just long enough for us to discover something that was lurking underneath. Um, but you didn't hear from me. Um, do something to break the pattern uh, get your energy back at a burst of energy and you need to attack all of the conditioning factors that make it so that you, you have to do stuff you don't want to do, right? And that's rough. I know that that sounds rough because it is rough. It's a rough situation, but let's be realistic here, right? What you're asking for, freedom in a harsh market, right? You, your, your job as a concept artist, which is already a crazy job to have, is sucking your energy and there's this other stuff you want to do. You are asking for the whole shebang. You're asking for the real deal, the big meatball, the whole cannoli. It's fish and the side of chips. You're asking for nobody's fucking life. That's what you're asking for. You're asking for the best, the best thing. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard and it's going to make difficult demands on you. So you've got to own that. And that's important because I, I found there's a lot of resistance to owning just how difficult it is to do and what you're asking for. Um, let me explain that a little bit more carefully. There can be a vibe in art which might be appropriate for the, the middling level, right? There can be a vibe where it's like, I'm not, we, we get in this tone of like, I'm not asking for much, right? And that's appropriate when we're talking about like getting paid a decent amount, getting paid a living wage, you know, having some vacation days, maybe not, you know, struggling in instability forever and things like that. Um, but we can get in this tone where we're like, I'm not asking for much. You know, I just want to fix this little thing. But the thing you're asking for is asking a lot and you need to own it. So you need to kind of snap into that. And when you talk about it with people, when you make your plans about it, when you try to fix things, you've got to be in the proper tone. You've got to say to yourself and to others, like I'm trying to do the hardest fucking thing and have a life that nobody has. Fuck you, you know, just own it. So that it, it, it changes, it changed a lot for me to realize 
what that request actually is and how energetic it is and how difficult it is and what you're trying to pull off there. Once you have your head right on that, then attack the conditioning factors. So some of the conditioning factors there are, you need to make a lot of money. That, that helps, you know, not a lot. Uh, the, that, that was just my way of, 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 of binning it, but you need to make an amount of money where you don't need to take every job. And I know that that sounds dirty, but you gotta do it. It's, it's just a, basically a necessity. I don't know your background, you may come, the money might not actually be a problem for you, right? You may be, you may have, you may have had another job, you have a lot of money or you have a support system or something like that. Um, I did not. So if I wanted what you're asking for, and I did, um, the, there was no way to, I couldn't bohemian my way through it. I had to be serious about like, obviously you need money, right? I, I didn't, I don't have any of those fallbacks. So you got to get the money right so you don't have to take every job. That's step number one. Then step number two, um, even if you, you're still taking jobs, right? It's just that you don't have to take everyone that comes in. You can be selective. You've got to engineer the jobs and the expectations of the people hiring you and the expectation of the gig and the, the every, everything around it. You've got to engineer all of that so that it's as close to what you want to do as possible, which creates a, virtual, a virtuous cycle where the work that you're doing on the gigs is as closely aligned as possible with what you would like to be doing, i.e. the stuff that you wish you were doing at night or whatever when, you're, when you find yourself, you've been drained by the concept art job. And then that, that work then goes out in the world and then slowly it snowballs where the gigs start coming back that look more like the stuff that you wanted to do in the first place anyway. The problem is if um, the work that you wanna do, the real work that you wanna do isn't super salable, if it doesn't really have a clear market spot, then you need to be more creative. Then you've got to go into business for yourself, uh, own that, you know, you've got to make your own niche, you've got to aggressively, I'm gonna say market yourself, but it's not, I don't mean boring marketing, I don't mean hustle culture bullshit, you know, I mean, make a market for you, show people, do what an artist is really supposed to do and show people what they didn't know they wanted instead of just giving them the same old shit that they're already half tired of anyway, all the fucking time over and over and over and over again, give them the stuff that they didn't know they wanted. But to do that, you've got to be pretty goddamn creative, right? You've, got, you've really got to have pushed it and given a, a serious amount of time and thought to the nature and quality of that work and that thing that you're offering the world. But um, that part does get pretty bohemian. If you can sink deep into that, um, and it's not just the work, but also getting comfortable in yourself and who you are and just being comfortable showing the world who you are and, you know, God, you know, the, the phrase people use these days is authenticity, right? But it's like, Shit, I hope authenticity isn't just a trend. You know, what, what if the next generation is like, man, fuck being authentic, fake everything. Like we, we might wheel, or wheel back around to formalism. That would be a shame. But um, you, you've got to, you've got to find out what parts of you are important for the calculus. You know, is it, is it all about the work? Is it part of you? Is it but, 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 like it's very, it's a very personal thing that you need to engineer for yourself. So for me, for example, when I got serious with myself, and again, I wanna say that don't just, don't expect to do what I do. It's like, it's supposed to be personal. It's supposed to be different for every person. So, but for me, when I took it seriously, what I was asking for and what I was going for, um, which was that step one, when I laid everything out on the table, I had to be honest with myself that, right, I'm important it can't just be about the work. What I want with the work that I do, there's, the market's not gonna work, the career's not gonna work, the life is not gonna work if I'm not involved, if my personality, me, just my presence is not part of it, which maybe that seems like a given now because you're watching me and a lot of you are probably here from my YouTube, which I'm all over, but you gotta understand 
before 2018, um, I used to get into fights with people where I would tell them it's all about the art. And people are like, Stephen, you're, you know, we love talking to you and you're, you're, you're good at talking and stuff like that. Like you should really get it out there. And I used to get into fights with people where I was like, I will never distract people from the work with my goddamn yapping because that would dilute it. I was that kind of person. So we all get caught up in our own delusions. We all get caught up in our own delusions. I spent most of my career being like, I would never dilute the quality of my work by inserting bleh, me into it and being distracting in that way because I was up my own ass. I mean, it was the biggest ego trip of all time. I was like, I need to know that people love the work for itself and not because they like me, which is the highest arrogance now, now that I look back on it. So now that doesn't mean you have to do it. For you, the opposite could be true. It's gotta be all about the work and nothing about you. Or for most people, it's there's a wide spectrum in between of how much of you is actually involved. I'm pretty far on the personal involvement spectrum at this point. I'm, you know, I'm deeply tied up with most people's experience of my work and that made it work for me. That made everything start clicking into place. And uh, I just wanna remind you again, it wasn't easy for me. It, it took a lot, it wasn't easy for me to see that and to admit that and to commit to that. It took a lot of, my inclinations were the opposite way, and it took a lot of hard nights looking at myself in the mirror, for real. That was a long answer. Did that help? Of any being authentic these days, at least on the internet, it seems like being a little fake. Well, yeah, I mean, for sure, like, I think about this a lot, you know, as someone who spends a lot of time on the internet and, you know, the, the philosophy of performance has always interested me. It's like, this is gonna sound really creepy, right? But the way I'm acting right now, this is the real me. But I don't act like this when I'm not on stream. Right, like, well, I spend most of my time alone, right? <laughs> like in my house, so I'm not just talking, well, I spend a lot of time talking to myself and singing to myself. But, um, like, it's like, it's all the real me. Let's be clear, like philosophically speaking, all of it is the real me, but how I feel right now doing this, this feels like the real me. This is the real me, you know, neurotic me getting angry because I can't, you know, I can't find something in the house or I'm just obsessing about some stupid bullshit. Like the, that me, that the, the one that's off the cameras, it's like, what are, what are you, what am I missing? Like I, I that, those parts of me are not, those are not great. <laughs> those are not good. I'm not happy. I'm not, I don't feel authentic and aligned when I'm being a neurotic asshole, uh, in my day to day. Um, there, so there's, it's like, there's one way to interpret that as some amount of me or people like me being fake, right? And yeah, it's fake, but, but, and don't get me wrong. I mean, all my close friends will tell you that you don't have to leave a big opening for me at a dinner party before I get like this. You know, I have to, I've had to a long, I've had to go a long, there's been a long road of me learning how to shut the fuck up. But um, there, there's some way to interpret that as being fake. But if you do it, if you're careful about how you align it, right? Like, for example, if I was sitting up here and I was like, well, you know, here's the new tutorial on how to, do, well, like the stuff that works for other people but never worked for me and was the, one of the main reasons I didn't want to have a YouTube channel, but I thought that was the only way you could do it. But, 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 if I was doing that, yeah, that'd be a different story. That'd be a lot of me faking it. But if you, I would never have this conversation unless someone had asked me the question that you did. Uh, Henrique, because it's like, this is real, um, this is like art career stuff, right? Um, if you align everything right, if you don't poison what you do with bad incentives, then there is a way to align what you do for a living in a very authentic way that feels like you, even if there is a performative aspect even if there is some part of it that requires some professionalism or branding or things like that, there's a lot of ways to do that wrong. 
But if you're as thoughtful as possible and willing to flex, right? Like see when you got it wrong, you're like, ah, fuck it, just clip it off, let's redo it. Um, then there is, if you have any inclination to believe it, hearing it from someone like me, there is a way to align it where it does feel real. It does feel real, you know? Hi, Summers. You're right, that is creepy. It is a little creepy, yeah. It's like the voice in your head is the person you are when you stream. Yeah, that's interesting. Kind of like an actor feeling the feelings their character feels. Yeah, I, I do. Like I said, the, the like the philosophy of performance stuff. Like that's a very deep rabbit hole. Like I, I think it is stuff like that, lava worm. Really, it's like because we. Oh man, we're really out in the weeds tonight. But I, don't you guys ever feel like we spend so much time sort of not not embodying our values or what we believe or you know we, there, there's always this this there's often this disconnect right between what we're doing day to day and sort of what we think matters and our priorities and our values and how we think we should be and stuff like that and in some sense life is can be seen as like trying to bring those different poles together, trying to balance them out. Um, and it, it's, if you've ever tried to do it, it's much harder than it sounds, you know? It's like, it's quite, it's quite difficult to, if, if we use the actor analogy or something, it's, it's quite difficult to make sure that um, the play that is being performed is one where it's appropriate for you to be the kind of character that you want to be. It's like that, that requires a specific narrative and story and, and acts to occur and things like that to happen. It's very, it's very strange. It's very strange. You're talking about what they say, the authentic self, which is somewhere deep inside there, but you have to work hard to get it out and reveal it to the world. Yeah, you gotta work hard. It ain't easy. It should be the easiest thing in the world. It should be the easiest thing in the world to be yourself. How is it not? <laughs> How is it not? I'm gonna to try to let this all stay pretty dark 
so that it feels like this whole abdominal area is turning very far away from the light when compared with like these muscles that are facing up and out. Sploige says, I don't know. The thing that confuses me is that my non-art job finds my life. I'm gonna assume you, you meant funds my life. Funds my life, so I constantly ask myself, is my art valueless? Your art is not valueless. Your art is not valueless. Yeah, like Henrique said, if you like what you do, that is the value, indeed. The, um, it's hard to sell work. It's like, just because people are not buying it does not mean that it has no value. That's like, that's just um, a cultural thing, you know? Um, there's, there's plenty of amazing high value artwork out there that is not getting bought. <laughs> is not getting bought. Um, so don't, don't, don't base your feelings about your work or anything like that on um, whether or not it's funding your life. I mean, that's, that's only gonna make it harder to get what you want going, going, you know? Um, I think you wanna separate out those incentive structures a lot of the time. And, and don't, be, don't be so sure that you would want that. You know, it's really easy to find yourself in that situation and then realize, oh, I don't like this. No. Because it just brings in new, new factors and new incentives. Having your art be your, the way you fund your life um, puts a lot of pressure on it, adds a lot of chaos. Don't be so sure you would want that. The grass is always greener. MS says, very nice drawing. Thank you so much. Glad to finally catch one of your streams from QC Canada. Well, greetings. Happy to have you here. And welcome from Nueva York, New York. It's New York. For anyone who's coming, who, who didn't catch it at the beginning, I do just want to quickly reshare. If you are keeping track of the AI stuff, you're worried about AI stuff, um, this, this is a tool that is being released by a team out of the University of Chicago. It's called Glaze. The link to this site is in the description of this video. This tool will help you protect your work um, from AI scraping. Um, and make it more difficult for people to replicate the look of your work. The tool is not available yet. I would just go to the website and bookmark it so that you know where it's at when it comes out. But there's download buttons. They do not work yet. The app is not, has not been released. I just want people to know about it. So um, look forward to that. Keep your eye on that and um, know that that is out there. Again, the link to that is in the description. You cannot download it yet. The tool has not been released yet, but there is info about the tool, how it works, what it's going to do. That is out there. Steven, can you tell a bit about how the feedback works in the FFI course? Is it per homework? Yeah, you, po you post in the community and I get to it. I try to respond to everything. That's what I've been doing for the past two weeks. <laughs> I spent the past two weeks doing nothing but getting caught up on feedback after January. You know, it's up to you how much you want to use. I mean, there, there's plenty of people in there who, who post every assignment. There's people who only post some assignments that they have trouble with, you know, it's up to you. But what people post, yeah, like I've said, I, um, if you post it, I'm going to try to say something about it, you know? I do a lot of drawovers. I do diagrams. But drawover, diagram, just text, if, if you post it, I'm going to try to give some sort of feedback. Even if it's just, hey, you nailed it.
Why is my neighbor using their table saw at 6 p.m.? What tile could really be so important to cut in the middle of my art stream? Sorry to repost, just something that depresses me. It says Nevitz. It's Nevitz Steven backwards. You can't trick me. I'm a Steven too. Used to love drawing for the first two decades of my life. Stopped for a while and now I can't get into it like I used to. It's like a phantom limb where my creativity used to be. That's normal. That phantom limb syndrome, feeling like there's some sort of horrible gravity there, even though that it's difficult and it's causing you nothing but pain right now for some reason, you keep coming back to it. That's a signal. That's a signal from the other side of the void. Don't give up. Do not give up on your creativity. You can break down that wall. It's not easy. It's gonna take a lot of work. It often takes a lot of reflecting, contemplation, reckoning with yourself. But if for basically everyone who has those feelings, it's worth it to do it. It is worth it to do it. Your subconscious, your complete body, the spirit body is trying to tell you something. Don't worry, I don't believe in spirit bodies. If you're not into that kind of woo-woo stuff, I don't want to <laughs> turn you off from what I'm trying to communicate here. But there is something, there is a vaster you that, uh, is trying to send you a message, I think. There's something going on underneath. Steven, could you spare a tip or two about expressing, expressing tension in a static pose? Like the muscle fibers on this image look like it's pulling against something. Like the muscle fibers on this image look like it's pulling against something. I'm thinking smaller fibers for greater tension but can't get the lighting right exactly. Um, I'm, not sure I, I, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're going for just because I can't see what you're, what you're working on, but... Um, Generally for me, when I need tension in a still image, um, moments like this or this are what do it. And um, what you'll notice about these is that the, the tight, aggressive little details, that is to say the, the tense part, I try to offset them with broad open areas. So it's like very itchy, very tense, very tight, and then more open, very itchy, more tight, more open. To me, that always makes it feel more like there's some sort of stretch. You know, it can't, it, it, weirdly enough, it, it goes flat and it feels not tense if there's detail everywhere and you need like a, a belly, like a wide open area. 
uh, you know, if you stretch a, if you stretch cloth, you'll see that it's when it's, it's when it's static or like coiled up like a spring, that's when there's details everywhere, right? And then when it's tight, it smooths out. And that goes for like just about everything, clothing, clothing, it's true on muscle fibers and things like that. So if you exaggerate it a lot, um, it will give you that effect. And it also goes for the whole figure as well. So you can arrange a tension over like a whole, um, It's like if you have a character design. Where there's a whole bunch of tension. Well, not tension, but detail. Grouped up in one place. And then there's openness. So if this just ends in nothing, it doesn't really feel tense. It doesn't feel like tension. It doesn't feel like there's a transference of energy. But if we cap it with another area, of detail to me now there's tension now there's like an implied pull from there to there and it all lives off of the contrast of the itchy area itchy area wide belly in the middle itchy area itchy area wide belly in the middle and this is obviously much more extreme than that, where there is still some stuff going on in the belly, it's just more open. No problem, gray white suit V. That table saw is really going. I have removed it from our lives. Noise suppression is on now. Goodbye, table saw. Paul says, Steve, you cool, bro. I'll be drawing more fun-loving goblins because of you. The people love it, man. Thanks. That's all people want. They just want goblins. That's all any of us want. All we want to do is draw goblins and consume goblins. And that's it. Don't make it more complicated. Can you share what you artistically struggle the most with? Says Octavio Sosa. Um, I 
What do I struggle the most with? Um, making pretty pictures. Um, I've had to be realistic. What do I struggle the most with? Uh, it's probably meta stuff, you know, like these days it's, it's the higher level stuff. It's like how to balance what I know I'm capable of with, you know, what I'll actually do or planning and things like that and making bigger projects and following through on things like that. Um, those sort of like high level things, those bigger systemic problems. Those are the stuff that, that's the hard stuff now. That stuff's tough. I'm not sure it ever gets easy. Thank you, Orangey. Hi, peeps. I didn't get a notification says any. How dare they? Damn YouTube. Not good, YouTube. Mm -mm -mm. I've never gotten a notification for your streaming. I mean, you know, hit the bell or whatever. Well, the thing about the stupid bell is that you hit the bell, that still doesn't mean you get all the notifications. You gotta hit the bell and then go to the little drop down arrow and say, you have to click get all notifications instead of get notifications for you. If you just leave it on notifications for you, they'll be like, oh, well, they only like Steven's videos. They, they would hate his live streams. No, well, you shouldn't tell them about his live stream. That's YouTube, by the way. That's what YouTube sounds like.
pressing real hard with the stump there to obliterate some hatching that I didn't like. Use good paper, folks. Use the good stuff. Is it better to use a soft brush to slowly build form or a hard brush? I was taught to use the hard brush, but I don't think it's working too well for me. I use the airbrush all the time. The airbrush is great. If you're making something that has a soft, smooth, curving surface, use a soft brush. Looks a little bit like Sandman for me, structureless creature. Sandman's a cool, cool idea. I don't like his, uh, I don't like the human, his hu classic human design though with the striped shirt. It ain't for me. What is your favorite color? Um, just oil paint colors that have crazy names like dioxazine purple and stuff like that. Matter Lake. If you mean like what colors do I use most often when I paint or something, I'm definitely a blue guy. I like blue. I'm partial to the, um, I'm partial to the colors that have a low value chroma point for painting because um, I just really like form. So things like a dark red or dark blue or purple, um, their chroma point is pretty low on the value scale. You know, red's 50% gray. Uh, purple and blue can be darker than that. Blue can be really dark. Blue's chroma point is like down at 60 or 70. So um, you can use that as a nice dark base and uh, get a really formy feeling by building up from there. I like that. No problem, Awa. Happy to help. Hi, 
Hi, do you think of the way you'll improve over time and how your art will be like if you kept on drawing until you're so old? I, yeah, I do think about that. That's like one of the most motivating thoughts for me. I've kept that one close for many, many years. I love, I love that thought. Just like, man, if I can just find a way to not give up until I'm 80, I could be really good when I'm 80, you know? I guess probably my peak would, your peak would be like what? You went hard, you took care of your health, so you don't lose too much energy. Probably 50, 50s, 60s. You could probably still make some of your best stuff, 50s, 60s. You could do some big things. You could do some big, big things. Davey Kin says, hey, how are you? I'm good, how are you? What's a chroma point? Chroma point is the value at which a particular hue tends to be at its most saturated. So yellow, for example, uh, has a very high chroma point. That is to say, yellow looks the most like yellow when it's almost white, you know, when it's 10% gray or 20% gray. Um, and when you leave the chroma point, its hue starts to shift. So yellow, if you bring it down into like 30, 40, it starts to turn into green or into brown, usually. That is, you know, on the color wheel, you might still be in yellow, but if you showed a, a person or just anyone, if you just had someone outside of context, if you showed them that swatch, they'd be like, that's green, that's brown. It starts losing its yellowness. And each of the hues tends to have a chroma point um, that, uh, that stays consistent. So red is like 50% gray. If you use the reddest red you can make in Photoshop and you make it black and white, if you use one of the good black and white processes, it's darker than you think. It's 50% gray. Um, this is a useful concept to have in mind because humans unfortunately have a psychological problem. It's not a problem. It's a, it's a foundation of visual perception, but, um, it's a thing, a real thing, you know, with a name, like many neurological things, it has a name that's like the name of the scientist who discovered it. So there's, I forget it right now, but like the mertzoff kernov effect or something like that, where your brain is literally actually hardwired to perceive an increase in saturation as an increase in luminosity when that is not the case. And it's one of the uh, one of the biggest problems that painters have to get over. You have to learn how to, you can't unsee that. Your brain is hardwired to see things that way, but you need to be aware that, you need to be aware of it and sort of filter it for yourself. So you need to know that a fully saturated yellow is brighter than a fully saturated red, and a fully saturated red is brighter than a fully saturated uh, royal blue or ultramarine blue or peacock blue or one of those kinds of blues. And that if you go, if you take blue, for example, and you move it up out of its chroma point, you're gonna have a problem. Um, well, blue, if you have the color range, when you bring it up into the higher register, it can become a new hue, cyan, which is like an electric blue. But um, if you don't have that range on the monitor or in your paints, you lift blue up and it's gonna lose its blueness. It's gonna become sort of paisley. Um, and again, like I said, I like to paint in blue because it still feels kind of blue even as you wash it up. It has a very nice travel up into the tints that can still make it feel for me. But red, for example, is extremely troublesome. If you bring red up into just, red's chroma point tends to be a 50% gray. You bring it up into just 40 or 30 and it's pink. It's not red anymore. Everyone will say it's pink, not red. All right, everybody. I just got the word that my wife is on the way home. 
So I'm going to end stream so I can go cook dinner. I'm going to go get dinner going. Steven, are you in the new crib? I am. I really am. I'm living in it. Let's turn off noise suppression for a moment and just listen for a second. Noise suppression is off. I know the table saw was going, but it's not going right now. Let's just listen for a second. Oh yeah. That's nice. My computer is the loudest thing I hear. That's what I want. That's the good stuff. But yes, I'm in the new crib. All right, everybody. I will see you soon. Um, maybe I'll stream again tomorrow, it's possible. But um, unfortunately, my catching up is aligning with I'm going on vacation tomorrow. No, I probably can't stream tomorrow. I got to pack. I didn't do any prep for the trip because I've been so busy. Um, but uh, I'm going to be on vacation until next week, um, seeing my family. And then I'm back and um, back to streaming. So I will see you all very soon. All right. Take care, everybody. And again, for anybody who's just tuning in, uh, if you're following the AI stuff and you're interested in tools to help protect your work, Keep an eye out for this tool, Glaze, by the University of Chicago, a team within the University of Chicago. The link to this page is in the description, but you cannot download it yet. The download buttons do not work. It has not been released, but go bookmark this page. It is a free tool that this team at the University of Chicago is going to be releasing that should help you protect your work from being replicated by AI. And um, just keep your eye on it. You know, let's see how it goes. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Happy drawing.